Hi folks, I'm Sheila and welcome to Councillor Convos. Let's get stuck in. Hi folks, welcome to Councillor Convos. I am delighted to be here chatting with Suzanne. Hello Suzanne. Hi Sheila, delighted to be here too. Oh, absolutely fabulous to see you. Folks, we are going to be talking about love. <laughs> love. Um, Suzanne, please introduce yourself if you're happy to do so. Okay. My name is Suzanne Brady. I am a relationship counsellor and coach. I've been working in the counselling industry now for, oh my gosh, I think over 10 years. Makes me feel old. Um, and I work with couples, families and individuals with all things relationship based. It's all good. Oh, it's all good, Suzanne. And, you know, here we are, Valentine's Day, the 14th of February. Uh, I, and, you know, this could be relevant for whenever anybody is listening to this because love, who doesn't need love, Suzanne? Every single one of us needs love, even if we think we don't. We do. I know, okay. Absolutely, Suzanne. There's so much we can talk about here. Um, yeah, I mean, here you are, you know, you work with relationships all the time. Um, okay, what gets in the way? What's What gets in the way of us having wonderful, loving relationships? I mean, apart from ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I like to, that's, yeah, that's number one to that, isn't it? Ourselves, which we'll definitely come back to. Yeah, definitely. That can be the number one. But I think the big thing from communication... And the misunderstanding of communication definitely causes a lot of difficulties within relationships. Um, and I think it's very easy when couples are in a tricky place in their relationship, then there's an assumption that whatever that other person is saying, there's an underlying meaning. And often that's where the, I think, lines get crossed. Conflict happens. Um, so a lot of the work I do with clients is really unpicking the communication the intention behind the communication and what's actually meant by that communication versus what actually lands. And we do a lot of work with the in-between there. Yeah, absolutely, Suzanne. And there's so much of that with the communication, the miscommunication, uh, the different meanings that people take. And I think, go back to the very beginning, ourselves first. It's recognizing the place that we're in. And look, we all have baggage. Whether we want to admit that or not, we all have baggage based on our experiences, our upbringing, based on the, on the relationships we first saw. For most people, it was the parents, it was the caregiver. And depending on what their relationship was like, and an idea of what did have a loving, healthy relationship. Well, a lot of times that's not always the case. And then we tend to copy that. You always come across that all the time, Suzanne. Yeah, it is. And, you know, you you just talked about baggage. And really what we're, we're actually talking about is belief systems. And a lot of these belief systems we've inherited, as you quite rightly said, from our parents, possibly grandparents, what we've seen, what we've yeah. heard, what we've observed, what we've even experienced. And a lot of these messages and these lessons that we just then roll out within our relationships they're often unspoken um and we just normalize that because that's always been our experience and then when we enter a relationship with another person who will have their own belief system that tends to be when these kind of conversations come to light because there's lots of conflict well that's not what i do or there's something wrong with you because you do something differently um, so that's where usually then people start to question, well, hold on, how am I showing up in relationships? And how do I want to show up in relationships? Uh, absolutely, Suzanne. And I think what we're talking about here is compromise and the, the compassion as well, that when two people come together, they both have different experiences. Like, ideally, it'd be nice if you're coming from the same waves and like, you want the same things and you might have the same ethics and... Do you know what I mean? Stuff like that is going to be important. But it's also important to recognise that some couples are very opposite, but they work really well together. And it is about that understanding that they have a different experience from you. And it's that compromise, that understanding that one experience isn't better than the other. It's finding 
a compromise and bring that together. Not always an easy thing to do, Suzanne. Do you know what? One of the things I love with my couples, and I will say this to each and every one of them, I love difference in a couple. I think it adds to the relationship. I think it really is that kind of magic ingredient until it's not. And usually when a, a couple might be in a tricky situation, that's where the difference plays out and it can become problematic. But as you said, it's, it's looking at that sweet spot. It's looking at that compromise. It's understanding that because you have a different way, it doesn't mean my way is wrong. We just have to work in a way that's going to work for both of us without a feeling that we're losing something because I think that's what keeps people in conflict around you know their differences they feel like they're having to give way or give something away so if you get to that space where actually we're always looking for the sweet spot we're always looking for that middle ground and both people can keep their identities certainly part of the work I love doing is what do you want to keep once you kind of recognize well this is how I show up some of that will be really, really good stuff. And, you know, when we talk about families of origin, often people get a little bit nervous. They think we're going to sort of criticize. But not all of the things that we bring into relationships are unhealthy. So it's it's very, very important to know what we want to keep, but yeah. then what's not so helpful. And then how do we change that? And most importantly, what do we want to change that with? So that's all very interesting one. Yeah, that sounds so lovely, Suzanne. I'm sure the listeners can hear the whole thing. Okay, we need to say so. Our <laughs> issues in our relationship. Um, absolutely. It is about your understanding. You know, sometimes becoming aware of your own background, uh, what was important to you, what you learned, and utilizing that, being able to keep that. And again, always not to the detriment of either person. And the thing is, look, folks, we're talking about a relationship as if it's two people. The thing is, a relationship doesn't have to be two people. You have other relationships that are polyamorous where you have multiple partners and it's all consensual. And that's the thing, like, times have changed a lot. Do you know what I mean? When you take up, especially in the Western world and the expectations and the, that it doesn't have to be just two people. What do you think, Suzanne? Absolutely. You know, those are the social norms, I think, that we've been living with and by and, and a certain amount of pressure that comes with that because that won't be for everybody the, the traditional setup of a relationship. Nah. So I, I think, you know, as long as people know what they're going into, they're making informed decisions about the relationships that they're entering. Yeah. Of course, with the polyamorous relationships, I think boundaries with any relationship is really important, but here it's really important so that, you know, people's feelings are protected and people know exactly it's around managing expectations. But of course, there's place for all types of relationships. And, you know, it's one of those saying love is love. And I think, you know, it can be overused, that saying, but really that's the, the basic truth. Love yeah. it, however we express that. Yeah. And you know something like the thing is, is that not everybody can love just one person. Like that's the thing, you know what I mean? And that's why I think it is important to have an open mind with this. Because like something like this whole kind of adventure thing of being with one person for the rest of your life, that doesn't suit everybody. And sometimes you know, even with friendships and you know, that reason a season or a lifetime expression, you know, that sometimes couples they really can work together at a certain place and time in their lives. But sometimes they do grow differently. And that's all really do. Sometimes we do, we get different interests, you know, and and love. You know, people can fall in love. Sometimes that is out of their hands, you know. And it, it kind of makes me think of some of the situations I come across in my private practice where people may be in a steady relationship, but they actually fall in love with somebody else. And the conflict that that brings, and it's very interesting working through the different dynamics of that because love, when we're in love, it's an amazing thing, you know, that rose-tinted glasses, the feelings, the hormones, everything that it brings up, that can become quite addictive for people. I've definitely come across that. Um, but it, I suppose what I'm alluding to here, you know, something we had a, a chat beforehand, Suzanne, is 
what what we label some things with affairs and stuff like that. I think sometimes it's really important to take the judgment out of this because as people, we're human beings, and sometimes we can fall in love. So it's like, for example, I'm getting married this year, and I'm I don't have the expectation that my partner is is going to love me and we'll be together forever. I'd like that, but however. I'm also aware that he may fall in love with somebody else. I'd I'd like to think that if that happens, we will talk about it. And if if we decide, okay, we're different feelings, or I want his happiness, I genuinely do. And if that means his happiness is being with somebody else, so be it. I, I does that make sense? It does. It does. And you know what you're really talking about there is is managing those expectations. Because, you know, what you're saying is, you know, I'm really excited about getting married. But, you know, I'm also open to the realism that, you know, sometimes we do find ourselves in situations that we wouldn't plan. And that's part of the work I I notice as well in private practice. People can sometimes be very, very confused with how they found themselves in this situation because their belief system, maybe they're identified as I'm not somebody who has an affair And one of the huge learning curves, I guess, for me doing this work is that we can hope we won't do a certain set of um, behaviours, but we can't always guarantee that. And when we find ourselves in that place of doing something maybe that we didn't think we would would be available to do, it's really, again, unpicking, well, what was happening? You know, how, how am I in this situation? How do I feel about this situation? And how do I want to deal with this situation? Yeah. Do you think that couples can come back from an affair? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I've seen the evidence of that. Yeah. But I think things, you know, need to happen um, when a couple, you know, they've ha- an affair has happened in the relationship. Yeah. There has to be accountability so what has happened uh, and a certain amount of responsibility for that. But for me, the, the most powerful work in um, transforming a relationship after an affair is really working out what was happening in that relationship, you know, before, during and after, because yeah. it's really the clues that we need. You identify the pain points then. So moving forward, we're not moving forward blindly then, hoping this doesn't happen. Yeah. The couple then are very clear. These are our pain points. And then we look at, you know, strategies and and different um, approaches that they can manage those with confidence moving forward. We're not saying we're never going to put ourselves into that position again, but you'd certainly be better placed, first of all, to be aware of the pain points. Yeah. Like you said, hopefully to be able to have a conversation around that, to talk about that, so that they can make informed choices moving forward. Yeah, there's so much to learn from, like that's the thing, do you know what I mean? Like, and and I suppose we think of people's needs, that sometimes people can fall into the behaviours that when they get married or when they're in a long-term relationship, oh, I don't have to make the effort anymore. And certainly from my own experience of work with other people is that, it's really important that we never take each other for granted, um, that, that we are always working on our relationships. And checking in is what I read recently about somebody that had this idea about checking in on their relationships. And I think that's a really important thing to do. What do you think, Suzanne? My clients are probably bored <laughs> saying you need to do regular check-ins. And I'm, I try to get each and every one of my clients to build this as a healthy habit into their relationship because it there are so many benefits to it. You know, on the practical side, you look at the visibility for what's coming up in the week, especially if you've got childcare, things like that. So great, we've got that practical bit. But also it acts as a ring fence for when we are harboring something, maybe we're upset about, but it's not the right time to talk about it. And let's face it, probably isn't a right time when people have busy lives. And the danger for me is then it goes under the radar, it doesn't get talked about, and then the next piece of conflict, then it erupts because actually we're on something else. So having that regular check-in, it gives the couple 
I think as well, a little bit of prep time. If you know you're going to be talking about your relationship, so it gives you that little bit of time to think, okay, how was the last week? Is there anything that I need to bring up here that would be useful? Is there anything that I'm kind of sitting with and I'm resentful with? Is there anything that's been really great about last week? Can I show some appreciation? So it's not all doom and gloom, but I just think it's a really healthy relationship because we're starting then to nip things in the bud before they fester i, I just love the idea of a check-in yeah well suzanne really hearing that and i hope for the nurses that are really hearing how important that is and checking with ourselves as well you know that self-love is so important like it's that kind of, you know, people might think it's quite cheesy to say about love yourself. You've got to love yourself first before you can love anybody else. You know, whatever, feel free to agree or disagree. But that self-love, that relationship with yourself, I feel is the most important relationship. And also as well as that, when we talk about love, here we are, it's a long by the time, time that this podcast will go out. But you know what? You don't have to be in a relationship to be full of love. Like, that's the thing that for some people, actually, they don't want to be in a relationship. They're quite happy being single and having a great relationship with themselves. And I really encourage that, that looking after you and, and that you don't have to be in a relationship. What do you think to that? Absolutely. I mean, one of the, the most, as you said, the most important, not one of actually the most important relationship is that relationship that you have with yourself because it's that awareness, it's that knowing. If you don't know what makes you happy, yeah, what makes you sad, yeah, what gets you excited, then how on earth can we expect our partner to know that? We yeah. have constant, a lot of pressure and value around the quality of the relationships. I hear it a lot. He or she would know. How would they if we don't know? <laughs> and then I come across that so much as well. This making something, well, he should know or she should know. Are you like, really? That your partner is a mind reader? Wow. <laughs> I remember a lovely supervisor I had at the beginning of my journey, and sadly she's no longer with us. But I remember taking something like that to supervision and saying, look, I don't really know how to work with it. This person is saying he should know. And she just looked at me and she said, Suzanne, that's like going to the butchers and waiting for a loaf of bread. It isn't going to happen. Uh -uh. And I remember thinking, thanks. Okay. How, how I take this into session, I don't know. But it, it comes back to me over and over again from working with clients. Yeah. That is the reality of it. You know, we need to know ourselves so that we can help support guide our partner and then if we're still not getting what we want it's a different set of questions if we're able to communicate or well, this is important to me this is yeah. what so if we're able to do that um brilliant but if if we're still not getting back what we like it is a different set of questions yeah absolutely uh, you know going back to that like first of all about know what you want first one knowing you now, I'd like to bring on to this topic of sex because I don't want you, Suzanne. I find that's a massive part of the dynamics of a relationship and often what brings up a lot of problems, you know. And that's the thing, like, when we talk about generation behaviours and stuff like that, like, here we are talking about knowing you first and then being able to ask your partner for what you want. For some people, certainly like myself, having such a religious upbringing, like masturbation, any of that, we're seen as a sin and all that. So that's all the stuff that you're kind of brought into. And I certainly know myself, I don't mind sharing stuff because I think it's important if we talk about stuff that we can share, um, whatever people are comfortable with. Did I know for myself that would have brought a lot of issues for me in relationships around nudity and sex and all of that. And, and feeling like you're a sinner if you touch yourself. And the thing is, is that like it is important to get to know you and your body, actually. You know, what you like, you know, because sex and passion and desire and connection, it is a massive part of a relationship. And I want to add to that. This was part of an article that I wrote on orgasms, okay? 
So I'm going to really promote the listeners to have more orgasms, whether that's self love, whether that's a friend with benefits. Okay. Let me say, I want you, did you know that orgasms can have great benefits like boosting your immune system, lowering anxiety, relieving stress, improving mood, and helping you to sleep better? That actually orgasm, orgasming releases oxytocin, which reduces cortisol and can reduce anxiety. So whether you're in a relationship or not, self-love, but also getting to know your body. So then if you do decide to be with a partner, you can say, actually, this is what I like. And hopefully they're able to listen to that. If they're not, then it's a different question because I know that one of the issues in my previous relationship was guys was thinking, don't tell me what to do. I know what you like. And then, <laughs> that was never going to work with you, Sheila. <laughs> <laughs> you know me so much. <laughs> But it, uh, and this does, Suzanne's known me for many years here. Uh, but you can see the issues with uh, and the pressure from guys like, you know, that my partner, fair play to, we've been through couples counselling ourselves. He doesn't mind me saying this. That for him as a bloke, he felt so much pressure that I'm a guy I should know. Yeah. Oh, my God. And it's, it is, it's those huge roles and responsibilities, you know. And I think, you know, I was just thinking as you were speaking, in my family, you know, we've all got labels, I guess, for each other. And um, one of my labels, definitely growing up, was I, Suzanne's prudish. Oh, really? Uh, and again, I came from a Catholic uh, background, went to a convent girls' school. Um, and I think, you know, for a long time, but I was very prudish. Yeah. Because, right, I grew up with the understanding um, that, you know, sex was almost dirty, not so much, not from my parents, I would say. This was more to do with probably my education. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's taken me a while to kind of move away from those limiting beliefs. And as you said, you know, embracing it, knowing that it's a very natural part of life and an essential part, you know, you were, you were just reaming off all of the um, health benefits. And I just thought, and the big thing is the enjoyment. So we're getting all of these health benefits, but the actual enjoyment, yeah. well, you know, can't be overlooked. But I do think, I do think we're moving in the right direction. Um, and people now um, really understanding the importance of knowing themselves yeah, so that they can get their needs met uh, and that they can meet the needs of others as well. Because, you know, if you're communicating what you want, it's a it's a very natural conversation then to ask that other person what they like, what you know, what would uh, interest them, what would excite them. So I think it just promotes a really healthy way of having these conversations and stepping out of the shadows of it being dirty and needs to be hidden. Yeah, it, it absolutely. It's going in the right direction, and and you know, I really welcome that, and I, I hope lots of other people do as well. And I really think. And I would really encourage any listeners to put their comments actually and to share with this conversation, maybe some of their experiences and some of their learning. So we can create healthy conversations, healthy ways of being, utilizing all these amazing things that are available to us without any judgments, without any shame, without the stigma from before. That again, it's each to their own. I'm always banging on about this, but I just kind of believe in. In, in do what feels okay for you. There was something else I wanted to bring up as well. We talk about love, and I know this has helped a lot of people, is love languages, Suzanne. For any listeners that might be familiar with love languages, can you explain a bit about them? I can. And I must admit, Sheila, when I was learning around love languages very, very early on in my career, I did kind of think, I don't know whether this is my bag. It felt a little bit fluffy, However, wow, again, my clients, they don't get away without doing this piece of work. <laughs> so, so important. So love languages, five main love languages, and there is a quiz. Uh, so the five main love languages, we've got um, quality time, acts of service, um, gifts, I'm trying to think of them now, physical touch and words of affirmation. Yeah. Okay, so those descriptors in themselves, for me personally, and I think this is where it felt a little bit fluffy for me, they're quite vague. 
and quite generic. Um, so you complete the quiz and then you score your love languages and, you know, whatever they would come out, um, your highest love language. The real value of the work that I send my clients away to do is the individual part then. So, for example, if your love language, um, the highest one was quality time, my idea of quality time and your idea of quality time would be probably quite different. Mm -hmm. But if I don't know what your vision of quality time is, then I'm likely to just apply my own logic to that. In terms of feeling loved and cared for then in a relationship, um, often we're missing, it's not landing the way we'd like it to. You know, yeah. I a lot. I do all of these and he or she never appreciates it, but they pick up the one thing I don't do. But And that's what I'm hearing then. They're not picking it up because it's not landing. It's not on their measure mm -hmm. in terms of their love language styles. Now, this doesn't mean that we have to morph into each other. And I have to make that very clear. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes wonder do my clients think I'm trying to clone them on <laughs> each other, uh, but it's not love languages. What we're really doing is creating a toolbox that we can dip in and out of. So when we feel like we want to do something nice for our partner, we know exactly what's going to land. Now this isn't from a manipulative point. Yeah. We want them to feel loved and cared for. And we know now through this information, this is what would make them feel loved and cared for. Mm. And I often think when we're implementing it, it's a bit like a smile. When you smile at a stranger, they just smile back. Yeah. It's instinctive. And when love languages are exchanged in a relationship, they, they, they continually be exchanged. You know, if I do something nice for you, you're more likely to think, do you know what? I'll, I'll do something nice. And that's what keeps these love languages going. Um, but also it keeps the relationship. It really kind of raises the value and it raises how people feel within those relationships. You know, they do, they end up feeling loved and cared for, thought about. Um, because again, it comes back to getting our needs met. Um, everything boils back. But we need to know what our needs are before we can get them. Yeah, and I think sometimes we need to be aware. Again, go back to love now, which is how we show, how we give and receive love. And generationally, there was a lot of people that um, it was a comfortable for them to say, I love you. Do you know what I mean? That in some, in some generations, that just wasn't a done thing. And for somebody, they might really want to say, hear that, yeah, I love you, but that might be comfortable for the other person. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't love you. They may show it in other ways, like the gifts, like the actual service, like different things. And for me, Suzanne, the love languages was a game changer for me, definitely, um, about the whole, because I think there was too much emphasis on kind of that you were loved if you were told you were loved. Whereas actually that is not the case. People show love in lots of different ways in the things that they do. Uh, you know, in not, and I think being able to understand that, being able to know your background, how you show and receive love, and to know your partner or whoever you're involved with, to know where they're coming from. Wow, you can really then move forward as in what helps them, what helps you. Oh, uh, but again, it's not a, a tick for tad. It's just because you want to add to each other's lives. You know, you you want, you know, like, there is so much. And, and I must say, the love languages, I've done a video on that on my YouTube channel where there's a link to it, um, the love languages test. So I last bent to put that in the write up with mm. this. And so this will be on my YouTube channel where people can look at the video about it and then go and do the test. Um, because I'd really encourage that to say it's such a game changer, isn't it? Because it filters across all aspects of the relationship. You know, you can really then understand how you communicate, how you want to be communicated with, how you do conflict. It it re and, and oh god, I'm so passionate about love languages because it is the gift that keeps on giving. Because yeah. then if you've got children, if you've got parents, friends. You can actually understand that, or maybe this is why, you know, they do that thing. Maybe this is why they value something um, that maybe we wouldn't value. Yeah. It just, it really kind of opens up a new understanding of how 
how we communicate and how other people communicate with us. And one of the things I would definitely say is it's not a one-off thing. I recommend that people um, do the love language quiz probably every six months. Oh, okay. Because, like, you know, we change more than anything. And, you know, if you've got two people in a relationship that are changing, their needs will always, uh, um, will also change. Now, some of those changes might not be significant, but some might, and it could be then you go back and have that conversation. What was quality time six months ago or a year ago? Actually, I've got a different idea around what quality time is now. So it, it's important to keep on top of it. And because it's such a lovely, light topic in terms of the quiz, it's quite fun. I always yes. kind of give my clients the heads up. It's a bit weird. There's some answers you might think, oh, I do none of them. I'm like, just go with what you're most like. No. So it's nice and fun and light. But the real work comes through going through those descriptors and understanding what that would look like in your day-to-day -day life. Uh, and letting your partner know in as much detail as possible because we think in images. So the more information we have by hearing, we're creating that image, we're more likely to retain it and more likely then to implement it. So it's really powerful. It, it absolutely is. Uh, and just kind of picking up one of the words about kind of being clear, being specific yeah. about what you want actually as well. So getting to know your needs, your wants, and then be specific as to what that might look like. You know, when we go back to the start of a conversation about the miscommunication, the mismeanings, the stuff that gets in the way, oftentimes I find it's because of a lack of clarity. Absolutely. They're putting stuff out there, but they're not really sure what they're asking for. They're not expecting to have to be married with that. And we really kind of need to take that kind of responsibility, you know what I mean, and own it. And again, being specific and you know, listeners, like, I, um, I'm going to let you decide. So, Suzanne and I have weekly meetings. We, we've been doing this. So we're probably into our fourth year now, Suzanne. Yeah, we are. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, we are a peer support for each other for whatever we need. And we're both very much interested and the belief in kind of the flip side, the positive side. The, the, you get what you focus on manifestation, whatever you want to call it. And when you talk about love and stuff like that, I really encourage when it's relationships or when it's yourself, focus on what you want and say the thing. So we talk about love language, but the language that you say to yourself, the way you're speaking to yourself, you know, put out there how you want to be toward yourself. So if you decide, okay, topic is love and I really want to love myself and be my own best friend, is to think about the sort of thing to be saying to yourself, you know, your good job or, you know, the dash, acknowledging your successes. A again, you mentioned that earlier on, like in the relationship, acknowledging when it's good, when you have those check-in sessions, really, and I would actually say more to the downside, make it more emphasis on the good side because we guess what we focus on to them. We do, we do. And it's just so important, I think, that you're able to connect with what you want. The amount of clients in my first session, they'll tell me they want to be happier in their relationship. And I always say to them, congratulations, so do I. Now, what would that look like? <laughs> but they always smile and it's kind of, oh, oh. Well, they don't have a problem telling me what they don't like, which for me is really helpful. Yeah. Because the work, not a problem. And I need that information. Yeah. But what's really clear for me is that it's easier for us to tap into what we don't want yes. rather than what we do want. And I do think there's that's the gap between knowing ourselves. There's that knowing doing gap. Yeah. You know, we know what we're uncomfortable with, but actually we don't know the flip. And that's my job to get people to, to yeah. kind of know and, and understand and explore that. But I do think there's a gap there uh, for most people. Um, and it's understanding really who you are, what you want, and that will be by asking those questions. You know, and just something you said there, Sheila, around the self-talk. Yeah. Make your clients speak about themselves in a way they would never, ever speak about another person. And, you know, it's powerful at times when I reflect that back to that person. Yeah. Um, 
I think, you know, often we, we talk about compassion, be kind, you know, there's all of these things that go around. But actually, it does need to start from within. We need to model that behavior. It needs to become a norm. It needs to become a habit that we can then mirror to other people. But if there's that gap again in how we treat other people, we treat them better with more kindness, more compassion, then are we ever going to be loved? Yeah. Are going to know what that would be like? Yeah, so that reminds me of um, that say we teach people how to treat us. Yeah. 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 It's so, yeah. and it comes back to that family of origin, you know, that just observations. And a lot of that will be, do we prioritize ourselves? And if we don't, why would other people, you know, and it, it is, it's very powerful work and the work can get quite deep, but it, it's just transformative when, you know, you really kind of t take it by, by the horns really and deal with it. You, you find it makes huge changes. Yeah, it's so worth it. Do you know what I think is quite sad, actually? You know, like with the work that we do with couples, the way that people wait to do a crisis before they come to counselling. Yeah, yeah. It's it's one of the things I hear a lot. You're our last hope. Yeah. You know, when you think about it, if your relationship is the most important thing for you, why wait till it's on its knees? If if you're even when your relationship is going well, it's great to engage in couples therapy. You know, to, to then, are we getting the most out of this? Is this the way to we need to be doing a bit differently? If we are great, happy days, why wait till it's on its knees? It, it, to me, it doesn't make sense. No, and do you know what? I have I have clients that I've worked with for years now, um, and they've got the idea, it's like a maintenance. Okay. Um, so I don't work with them every week. They don't yeah. need every week but I work with them on a regular basis and sometimes they would say to their friends you know oh we're going to therapy and they say but why do you go to therapy you know you're getting on and they go that's exactly why we go to therapy <laughs> and you know it is to keep the relationship fresh it's to again to revisit some of these things to check out is this yes. thing for us if there's life stages and changes coming up how can we prepare for them so it, it's really how you look at therapy. And I think this is why lots of people put it off because for some clients, I think if they think they need outside professional help, then is the relationship doomed? You know, are we really in this much trouble that we need somebody else? So they try and do the fix themselves. And I think for other people, um, they're nervous of the process. Yeah. You know, they sometimes... I, I wonder what people think therapy's like. They're terrified. And I, you know, for me, one of the things I try to do is relax my clients because I know I get the best out of them. They get the best experience. Yeah. But I do wonder sometimes, you know, what, what do people think therapy, especially if, you know, we talked earlier about where somebody's had an affair. Yeah. Do they feel that they're going to be judged? Do they feel that, you know, there's going to be punishment of some sort. Yeah. Uh, a lot of, you know, I think that can feed into the reluctance uh, and then it's the desperation. Okay, right. If something doesn't change, now I'll go for help. And of course, we, we still work with those clients and we can still make huge progress. But for them, it's the pain, I think, and the damage that is, is continuing to happen whilst they notice there's a problem with the gap between when they get help then the, the damage is still happening. Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely, you know, for any nurses, I would really highly recommend whether it's working on yourself or working, you know, in a couple or a group couple, is don't leave it to the last minute. You know, there, there, there's so many benefits of going into therapy. It's non-judgmental. You know, we're not there to criticize or to blame or to point none of that. It's the complete opposite, actually. And I often find that with clients are thinking, oh my God, I can let me say and do whatever I want and I'm not being judged. It's such a relief for them to have the space and to offload. And the thing is, like, I mean, I find sometimes with couples when they come in that one person thinks the other person needs to change. Now, you tell me what she needs to do. You tell, you just tell him what he needs to do and we'll be all right, you know? <laughs> that, look, it has to be self-accountability. And sometimes I do bring in the humor. I bring in my comedy background. 
to kind of highlight behaviours, to use humour, to relax people and to take luck, you know. And it does work, actually, you know. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I was just thinking that I remember a couple of clients who, you know, when I've been the opening kind of assessment stage and asking them, you know, what, what's brought you to counselling and what are you hoping to get? And they'd been sent. <laughs> oh, no. And, you know, I, I remember it's quite sad, actually, one guy said, I, yeah. I, I need to be fixed. Oh, look. Show me somebody who's fixed. None of them are fixed. It'd be boring to be a parent. <laughs> well, show There's me looking at nothing. You know, good luck with that. Oh, wow, that is sad. That That is sad because that, oh, unfortunately, I suppose that's the state of therapy. Yeah. The, the, I think we just need to remove that. It doesn't mean anybody's broken. None of us are broken. We're all fine. It's just sometimes life gets in the way in circumstances and sometimes it's hard to, to work it out when you're in it. So it's up here to ask for that support. Yeah, I think just having that third person, you know, clients often say, oh, we can communicate better. We can even have conflict when you're with us. But there's nothing magic around me being there, but it just creates that different environment, um, that disruption to the old patterns. And that's what creates space, as you said, then to to do things differently. Yeah, absolutely. I know, and I know we're talking about relations and stuff like that, but even like family dynamics. So myself doing the family therapy, you know, I've I've had some amazing outcomes, you know, with kind of mothers and daughters, you know, fathers and sons, and just that miscommunication again, the love language and you know, that when you actually realise that you're coming from good intentions and you're coming from a good place or, or we just become aware of the impact of your behaviours because most people do want to be happy. Most people want love. Why wouldn't we want love? Um, you know, but we want to be able to relax in that love and to enjoy it and to be able to be ourselves as well without the judgments and all of that. So it, it is incredible in therapy where you can highlight where some of the, the person's judgments comes from. And it might be their own, it might be generational behaviours that are interfering with their current family relationship, you know. I mean, wow, that there's, there's so much we talk about here. There's I'm not on this subject. I know. No, we don't, we, you know, we, if the listeners listen, they're thinking, oh my God, this is great stuff. Can you talk about da da da? Please let them know. We're waiting. Step <laughs> away. So, you know, in a way like that, uh, we just hope that always having uh, this conversation about love is helpful for people listening. So, please let us know and let us know if there's anything else you'd like us to talk about. Um, so, Zan, there's so many different things to check in, really, you know, kind of stand out the love languages. Anything else you want to kind of just emphasize before we finish, you know, our chat today? Be curious. Ah. I think this is a really, really, it's, again, another game changer. It's subtle, but when we hear things that we kind of think, I don't know what he or she means. Give it some space first, I think, to, to have that pause. But then to be curious. Now, the you would probably know this, Sheila, why can be quite inflammatory at times in relation. <laughs> it can sound here accusatory. But when you're taking it from that curiosity position, mm. so I wonder what's going on for this person. I wonder yeah. why they're choosing to say this. I wonder why they're choosing to do this. And you really are taking it from that position of learning, trying to find out more. That can change and transform relationships in an instant because what happens up until that point is we've created our own idea around what that behavior means what yeah. that intention is uh, and therefore we're not open to changing anything but if we if we think it's unhelpful create some space for it and be curious and then you know have that exploration like it is very important that you let the other person know this is what you're doing. That's <laughs> 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 strange. This is why the check-in again, so <laughs> the check-in. That's a really good time to use the check-in, uh, the wow. position within that. So you're both primed. You know what you're there to do. It's to talk about the relationship. But I think that can really give you a very different perspective, a very different understanding of what that other person means. And then you can work on, okay, 
when you say this, this is kind of what I hear. So together we look at that sweet spot. Well, how can we change that? You know, how can we both move so that that transaction of communication lands better? Wow. And, you know, I can't understand, like, hearing on it is such a valuable information to be curious. So instead of jumping to conclusions, which is what all of us can easily do and have found ourselves doing, is to have that pause and just be curious. I wonder what's going on for them to say something like that. And they could be triggered by something else. You could be triggered by something that they've said. And it's one them saying something, but it's how you've heard it. And then could you imagine that? Like, how about only something? Now, I've heard it like this, da, da, da. Is this what you mean? It might be, no, I didn't mean it. Ah, can you tell me more? Like, it's amazing, but we just kind of can down. And <laughs> I kind of, you know, take a breather. Sometimes we need to walk away. I was at the clients. I said, if you need to go into the house and pet Holly Cat, you know what you need to, <laughs> you know, because sometimes when emotions get out of hand, it's lost it. You have to, at a certain level, of being able to be calm, to have those, to be curious and have those chats, you know. Um, but that message is so important, Suzanne, about being curious. And what well, if I really get to know my clients very well, I don't call it the curious position, it's the idiot position. I know nothing. That's the position I really want you to go in. I know nothing. Um, I always think of that faulty towers. Is it Manuel? But no That's the position I really want you to be going in with. Uh, so that you're open then to hear yeah. you. Yeah, hearing, actually listening, you know, and uh just be mindful of your own kind of behaviours and triggers. And stories, yeah. Yeah, there's so much. Well, you know, look, listeners, we hope this has been helpful. Anyway, you know, let us know. Let us know. <laughs> <you want. laughs> yes, we enjoyed it. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, please feel free to put comments and to add this conversation because, again, I've said this before, I don't believe anybody's the expert and we're all learning from each other. And it's great we can have a part of different ideas and experiences and people can pick from that part. Like, ah, I like that. I'll use that. Suzanne, thank you so much. So now where can people find you? Um, my company's Positive Relationship. Uh-huh. Um, so I'm based, well, I'm based in Birmingham. Yeah. I have clients from all over. So um, feel free to, to give me a call or reach out. Fantastic. So can they find you your website and positive relationships? Yes. Oh, yeah. It's www.positive-relationships.co.uk. Oh, fantastic. Um, again, Suzanne, thank you so much for your time today. It's been you know, a pleasure, as always, speaking with you, Suzanne. Oh, same right back at you. <laughs> Good stuff, Suzanne. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day. And you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Counselor Convos with Sheila McMahon. If you've enjoyed this video, consider subscribing to the channel.